Hey team, this lecture here is going to be on imperialism in Africa. It's going to focus on sort of growth of these empires in Africa, the reasons behind them and kind of where they were and who was building them. Um, give you a couple strong examples of that. We'll look at the economic consequences of imperialism and then also the responses of Africans to state expansion. All right? And I think that ends up being 6.2... 6.3, 6.4, as far as the topics for the unit go. Um, people still debate the sort of relative damage or merits of imperialism in Africa and in Asia or in the, all the other parts of the world we'll look at. Um, and there's good arguments on both sides, right? People that can make sort of economically good points about how imperialism was a total disaster for the colonized or for the colonizer as well, right? That it was very expensive and things like that. There's people that can make the opposite arguments, right? And uh, that these countries grew fabulously rich off of exploiting the places that they colonized or that the companies in those countries grew very rich. Um, I tend to agree with, <laughs> with the latter there, right? I don't think there's much good about the stuff that we're studying here. Socially, I think it's really important to remember that the United States, for example, our country is among the first of the countries of the modern era to resist policies of British imperialism, right? With revolutionary violence. Um, and this is without any of the racist kind of social Darwinist perspectives that we're going to see adding insult to injury in European imperialism in Africa, right? But our own country is a good example of people that saw this kind of experience and resisted it themselves without it maybe being as bad as it ever was in Africa. So with that in mind, let's uh, jump into it here. All right, first thing I want to look at with you guys are a couple maps of Africa to really get a sense of its scale and size and diversity. This is a map showing different language families, language groups, um, and really gives you a strong sense of the diversity that you see there, right? Keep in mind that these are what are known to linguists as language families, right? Big groups of related languages. For example, all the languages in Europe are in the Indo-European language family. Um, but that doesn't mean any of those people can talk to each other, right? So when you see, you know, people in France and people in Russia, technically you go back far enough in history, their languages are related, doesn't mean that they can communicate and have a conversation, right? Likewise, when you see this sort of big green area around the Congo in Central Africa called, you know, Bantu languages, um, it doesn't mean they can all talk to each other, right? That's actually hundreds of different languages. There's something close to 2,000 or 2,500 different languages spoken in Africa. This map gives you a little kind of sense of that. Um, another one I like is this one here, which um, I think I've gotten from the New York Times in an article they ran. Uh, one of the newest countries in the world is southern Sudan, is in Africa. And it came out of a civil war in Sudan that you could, and a lot of people do, trace back to the time period we're talking about, the conflict there in Sudan. If you look in the circled area on this map at the country of Sudan, you can see a northern area that's mostly speaking Semitic or Hamitic languages, right? Arabic is what these people are speaking. They're, they're black Arabs in the north of Sudan. In the southern part of Sudan, you find a lot more Christians, a lot more animists, people doing sort of traditional religions, um, but also different language groups, right? Different language speaking, uh, different, pe pe different people speaking different languages down there, right? And the divide of North and South Sudan now runs kind of along those borders. Um, this is one thing I want to try and talk to you about as we kind of explore this issue here today is how multiple ethnic groups and linguistic groups were either put into one country, maybe in a situation where they wouldn't get along, um, or were divided across the borders of several countries instead of united into a kind of nation state like Europe had. This last map I think I got from The Economist magazine, which um, – 
is an excellent one in trying to get a sense of the scale and size of Africa. Again, it shows you some of the largest countries in the world, the United States, China, India, which have hundreds and hundreds of millions of people in them, you know, plus a bunch of others, Japan and Spain, you know, or the rest of Europe, I guess, Mexico. You can squeeze all of them in there um, with room left over. So it is a massive place. Once again, it's not really fair or accurate you know to use uh to use an expression like african but i'm going to be doing it a lot in this lecture so i apologize in advance another thing to point out once again is that as i mentioned in the previous lecture the growth of european political control economic control of the world is not a change in period six but it is a continuity from period four, right? From the age of exploration and discovery, from the times of Columbus and before that. Um, going back to the early 15th century, we were talking about Portugal and Henry the Navigator beginning to explore the west coast of Africa. Um, explorers like Vasco da Gama to round, rounding the Cape of Good Hope and entering into the Indian Ocean, making it to the coasts of India. Um, ooh, European colonization and imperialism goes back that far, right? At that time, it was focused in the Americas. So at this time, it's going to be focused in other parts of the world. Beyond just simply sort of exploring coastal areas, remember that Europeans were establishing trading post empires at this time in Africa, right? Um, imperial holdings under European control, but that were mostly confined to the coast, but they were doing that through violence, you know, outright in conquering areas. They were also increase, uh, increasingly involved in the African slave trade, right? Something already native in Africa, but dramatically increased in its scope and scale um, by European involvement. Um, and those are the ways that we've talked about European involvement in Africa previously. When we get to the middle of the 19th century, what we're talking about, the 1800s, European control of Africa at first remained mostly confined to these coastal areas for technological, medical, economic reasons we're going to get into in a moment here. But the Industrial Revolution led to a much greater push for exploration and colonization. This time, some big differences being that the major players would be a little bit different, not Spain and Portugal primarily, whose empires were now in a state of decline, but instead countries like Britain and France, these other classic European powers, and new countries like Italy and Germany that were, you know, actually sort of brand new, as well as small places like Belgium, would play these major roles in this global scramble for territory markets and resources. And then Let's compare these two maps as well. I've got one on the left here you can see from 1880, right before the really big explosion of European conquest across Africa, and one from 1913, right the year before World War I, where you can see basically all of Africa, except for a very small handful of places, Ethiopia and Liberia, have been conquered by Europeans and turned into European imperial holdings. Um, if you look on the left, uh, all the gray areas would be places where there were not necessarily states, right? Places that we've talked about as stateless societies, right? Where there's no sort of administrative structure at the national level or even at a provincial or district level, right? Everything is done at a real local kind of village scale uh, in terms of, of governing, right? Um, and for... Europeans, I mean, that basically meant, you know, you weren't doing anything, right? That, they, that you were free for the taking. But the other thing that we really need to pay attention to on that map is that there are a lot of not stateless societies, right? Caliphates and really powerful places like the huge, vast Ottoman holdings in North Africa, or like the Ethiopian Empire, the Sokoto Caliphate, um, the uh, Marina Kingdom in uh, Madagascar, right? These big, powerful states for the time that we will see some in some cases were equivalent in their strength to European states, right? Um, those were also common in Africa. And when these places are being conquered, it's important to remember that these are countries being invaded and conquered. And a lot of the primary sources that we might see later on, have Europeans talking about 
conquering these kind of virgin landscapes, these untouched areas where nobody lived and they weren't really being used by the natives. So it's okay that we take them. Um, that's not the case, right? I mean, maybe that particular area, some little piece of land wasn't being used, just like you might not be using every square inch of your backyard, but that doesn't mean it's okay for somebody to move in there <laughs> and start building a home in your backyard, right? Um, but you will hear a lot of Europeans from this time period in primary sources justify their conquest by saying we're not even really conquering anything, right? A lot of this land is sort of un unoccupied. I, I don't generally agree with those arguments. One of the big reasons was they were incapable of it earlier, right? That, that like we said, Africans were able to trade for weapons during the slave trade, that they acquired large and powerful armies that were adequate, adequately equipped to deal with Europeans a lot of the time, right? And that sometimes when Europeans themselves during the times of the slave trade, tried to perform their own raids for slaves, they were defeated by Africans on the field, right? Especially if the battle was, you know, using swords and and, and uh, handmade weapons, where everybody was on a more sort of equal footing back in the 1400s. By the end of the 1800s, that's not the case. The Industrial Revolution had given Europeans... Um, a great abundance of weapons they already had, right? The ability to mass produce weapons and ammunition that made it a lot easier to fire off a lot of rounds in battle, but also they were producing the first really modern kinds of weapons, right? Machine guns that could shoot 500 rounds a minute, right? 11 rounds a second, like the Maxim gun, as it was called, named after this guy you see in the top right, Hiram Maxim, an American. Um, this weapon becomes so popular that there's a sort of famous rhyme among British colonists. Whatever happens, we have got the Maxim gun and they have not. So one part of this answer to why didn't this conquest happen earlier is Europeans couldn't successfully do it earlier. They were militarily maybe incapable in one sense. But once technology provided weapons like this, it gave them an overwhelming advantage, and relatively small European armies were often able to defeat large, uh, poorly equipped African armies. Another big reason that was hindering European exploration of the interior of Africa was malaria, right, and the lack of, of European ability to deal with this disease. Um, Malaria is mostly transmitted by mosquitoes, and it is super deadly, especially throughout most of history. I think as far as killers of humans go, I've heard some people say it's killed the most people out of anything. You know, any disease you want to pick or anything. If you go back throughout all of history, I think more people have died from malaria than anything else. Um, now, the map on the left that you see down there is sort of all the different places where you can find people getting malaria, right? And you can see it around the Mediterranean coast, throughout the Middle East, in the sort of swampy marsh areas that are, you know, on the coastal areas there, throughout India, and then throughout big chunks of Central Africa, where there's a lot of sort of tropical rainforest. It's where mosquitoes will hang out, right? In sort of moist, damp climates. Um, the thing is that the map on the right shows where you find the, I don't know, disease or disorder of sickle cell anemia, which causes a lot of problems for people, but offers a kind of natural resistance to a lot of the problems of malaria. So there's kind of like a sort of natural selection going on here, right? That people that have sickle cell anemia are more likely to survive and deal with malaria, right? And so you over thousands of years, you see these concentrations in India and in the Middle East in you know, parts of southeastern uh, Europe, and then big concentrations throughout Central Africa of people with sickle cell anemia and a kind of natural resistance to malaria. Most Europeans didn't have these resistances, just like most Native Americans didn't have resistances to European diseases, right? Europeans didn't have tropical climates and generally didn't have these immunities that some of the places they were colonizing in India or the Middle East or Africa 
had, right? And again, sickle cell anemia is kind of a disorder, mostly a problem, unless you're getting stung by mosquitoes with malaria, in which case it, it can maybe help you. Um, but due to explorations in the Americas, quinine was discovered. It was used as a muscle relaxant by some of the Indian groups there in Peru and Bolivia. But Jesuit missionaries had discovered it and its properties and sent it back to Europe where it is first used to treat malaria in the middle 1600s, right? So they had acquired military technology and now medical technology that, that allowed them to penetrate further into the interior of Africa. The scramble for Africa, as it's known to historians, was driven by a variety of economic, political, social factors we talked about in a previous lecture, um, but these changed frequently over the decades, right? Whether it was um, settler colonies that Europeans were trying to establish to relieve pressure on their growing industrial populations, um, which whether or not people actually moved to these settler colonies is another question, right? Most people were migrating to the United States out of Europe, or they were migrating to Australia, or these other places where land was plentiful and, and actually, actually... Um, a little more welcoming, right, <laughs> instead of these conquered territories in Africa. But settler colonies was one reason that conquest begins there. Um, Europeans would make exclusive claims to the use of certain waterways, like the Suez Canal or certain trade routes. Um, they would monopolize the use of certain resource areas, staking claims on gold mines and diamond mines, on forests filled with rubber vines and deserts covered in salt flats and and with oil beneath them. Political cartoons from this era express this kind of desperate competitiveness for ever more control and the wealth and glory thought to come along with it. One of the great politicians of the age was Otto von Bismarck. We talked about him as the guy that helped to forge the new state of Germany, which on the day that treaties were signed that brought Germany into being, instantly kind of made it one of the most powerful industrial states in Europe, and Otto von Bismarck, along with it, became very powerful. Bismarck used his sort of diplomatic clout to try and prevent what he feared would be the outbreak of war in Europe, or elsewhere, between European countries. Bismarck wanted to maintain a stable Europe to prevent conflict, um, and sort of maintain the peace, give this new country of Germany probably a stable place to grow, right, without getting in, caught up in a bunch of wars. So between the end of 1884, November 1884, until February 1885, Bismarck organizes and holds this conference that comes to be known as the Berlin Conference, where delegates from several European countries get together and uh, draft what's known as the Act of Berlin, where they were going to sort of lay out rules and establish ways for European countries to make and seize claims in Africa without coming into conflict with each other. All right. Some of these rules were, for example, to notify other European powers of the claims that you make, right? We're going to let everybody know, hey, I'm taking this territory or that territory. Um, other rules in the Act of Berlin were that the territory you claim needs to actually be occupied by representatives of your country, typically soldiers, in order for that claim to be valid. It called for certain free trade areas throughout sort of Africa that every company in Europe, like a corporation, had a decent right to trade or do business wherever they could throughout the continent. Um, and it opened up the Niger and Congo rivers to all shipping, right? Anybody could sort of send boats down those rivers. Um, and it sort of tried to stop the monopolizing of those trade routes. Um, it also included rules to work to end slavery in Africa, which was disappearing anyway, but still existed in parts of Africa. And so because some of these people believe they're on a kind of civilizing mission, that also made the cut that we're not just there to sort of do things for ourselves. We also have this spiritual quest of ending slavery. 
there were no African delegates at this meeting. No Africans consulted about the borders that were being drawn or the problems that might be caused by some of those changes. Um, but it's with this that the scramble for Africa really gets a stronger push, where the risk of conflict with other European states is minimized. And in the next 15, 20 years after this, you're going to end up with this map that we see here, right? Almost every piece of African territory covered in European empire. What usually preceded this um, and was going on sort of during and, and after this Berlin conference was agents of various European states and European corporations flooding into Africa to begin to sign what were called treaties of protection with the local rulers there. Some of them emperors, you know, with full administrative staffs and things like that. But in a lot of cases low-level local rulers, many of whom were often illiterate. I mean, because they came from language groups that didn't have a written language at the time, like a lot of Native American languages, for example. Um, these people were asked to sign contracts, right, with European corporations or states um, when they were not necessarily equipped to understand these legal documents written in a foreign language. Um, these treaties were often deceptively described to these rulers who would kind of ignorantly sign them thinking that they were treaties of friendship or alliance when in fact they were surrendering local control of the territory, the resources in there and their own political power to Europeans. The discovery of these deceptions and disagreements would lead to resistance from African states once they realized they'd been misled and deceived. Um, merchants who believed those treaties had created these giant free trade zones in Africa, and they were free to, to do as they wish now, worked to cut out the traditional African middlemen that had played a role in trade and go right to the source of raw materials themselves. When African resistance uh, when Africans resisted those incursions, um, European militaries would be called in to protect or avenge the interests of whatever corporation, or sometimes it was a missionary group, right? Missionaries being attacked, trying to go to some village. They would request help from the army and get it um, to go secure these areas where Europeans were threatened. This is just another one of the ways states would kind of justify to their own people sending military power to Africa and building these states and enforcing these treaties and protecting their sort of legal interests in the area. But I've included a primary source document um, of one of these kinds of treaties on the right here, one of the standard treaties of the Royal Niger Company in North Africa, which would get people to sign treaties very much like this. And if you take a moment to sort of read it over, I won't read it all to you here, you will see there's some language in there that gives Europeans a lot of power, right? And the, the idea is that a lot of the leaders signing these contracts were not fully aware of what they were signing. You know, there are parts of this contract that say that this company, this corporation is going to have full power to settle all disputes, whatever their cause in the country, um, that the Nigerians were not going to um, deal with any other foreigners, that they would agree to receive whatever payment their colonizers decided to give them for the land they wanted to take. Um, it, it, it's not a good contract if you take a moment to look it over. And as people figure this out, it would lead to resistance to European imperialism across Africa. Resistance was frequent and common in the conquest of Africa. All right. So while many Africans, you know, willingly collaborated with European colonizers, many others actively resisted with violence. Um, that violence took two distinct forms we'll describe here, guerrilla warfare and direct engagement. Guerrilla warfare is often described as consisting of kind of hit and run tactics, right? A lot of sabotage and propaganda and generally a kind of warfare that avoids large direct confrontations of, you know, 
army versus army, and instead attempts to make the enemy's occupation of territory as expensive and as politically unpopular as possible. You know, for example, trying to frustrate the conventional soldiers they're fighting and then take political advantage of any kind of retaliation from those soldiers that kills civilians or things like that, right? That would be a kind of guerrilla tactic. But otherwise, trying to keep fighting in a way that the enemy has to keep soldiers in an area, but in a way of low intensity where you're not taking a lot of damage, you're not doing a lot of damage, but the expense to the occupiers is a lot, all right? You could think of modern groups like the Taliban in Afghanistan um, that whether we're talking about the 1980s where they defeated the Soviet Union or whether we're talking about, you know, the last 17 years where they have fought us to a stalemate. We're negotiating with the Taliban to try and withdraw from Afghanistan right now, right? That is an example of a successful guerrilla war, right? Of a weaker army kind of defeating a more powerful conventional military, not through killing more people or something, but by just making it too costly, too unpopular to continue the occupation or the war. African examples where you can see this include the Igbo people of Igbo land, as it was called um, in kind of Southern modern Nigeria. Igbo land was conquered relatively quickly in about three years but the Igbo continued to resist and fight through guerrilla tactics for an extended period which ended up making it you know decades until Britain could sort of fully secure the area and um, start to derive some kind of profit out of it all right but African states also resisted through outright military confrontation of army versus army this is a lot less common as African armies generally lacked the most modern equipment. Guns were not really uncommon in African armies, but the new, for the 19th century anyway, the new machine guns and heavy artillery used by European armies was exceedingly rare, and for the most part non-existent in Africa, except in the hands of Europeans. That's primarily why a lot of colonized people resisted through guerrilla warfare and not army versus army, right? They picked the way favored by less well-trained, less well-equipped militaries. Um, and so although there's a lot of examples, as you can see, I think I got this map from our textbook, there are lots of examples of African resistance. We're just going to go over a couple so you have some of those in your head, um, but I encourage you to click the links that I've got here for you and learn a little bit more about some of these conflicts um, to sort of flesh that out for yourself. And they're all very interesting stories and battles of, you know, the weak standing up to the strong in really kind of heroic ways that that's, that's cool to hear about. Um, but I'll try to summarize a couple of these for you, starting with the Zulu, um, which was a kingdom, the Zulu kingdom near South Africa, um, where if you see, the country of Swaziland in sort of the very, you know, southeastern part of Africa. Um, that is right around where the Zulu kingdom once was. The Zulu had, engaged, had had several wars and engagements with the Dutch settlers that had previous been, previously been there. We'll talk kind of more about that later. These Dutch had been pushed out after the British conquered their Dutch Cape Town colony. Um... And the Dutch fled to kind of the more northern part of South Africa, and where they came into conflict with the Zulu there. And the Dutch were able to win a lot of these engagements due to their superior firepower. But as time went on, tension sort of grew between these three powers, the Dutch or the Boers, as they were called, um, the British settlers and the Zulu. After the British had conquered all the various Dutch territories from the Boers, um, and turned it all into kind of British South Africa, they came into conflict with the Zulu as well, who wanted to sort of push them out of these territories, right, and, and kind of maintain their power in the area. Um, they actually won their first engagement with the British. The Zulu won a battle known as the Battle of 
Isandwana, Isa, Isandwana, excuse me, in 1879, um, because they had better tactics and numbers. They did not have superior weapons. For the most part, those Zulu soldiers were using spears and a couple old muskets. Um, but the British would reinvade Zululand with a much larger army and deliver some devastating defeats to the Zulu, conquering the whole area. In the case of Ethiopia, which was then known as Abyssinia, if you look in sort of East Africa near the Horn of Africa, um, you will see Abyssinia there. Um, their ruler, known as Menelik II or Menelik II, had actually been supported by Italians, um, hoping to get his approval for Italian colonial claims in Ethiopia, hoping to use him as a kind of puppet king or emperor. Um, Menelik would end up denying the Italians' claims, but in the meantime, he had learned from Orthodox Christian supporters, because Ethiopia was is one of the oldest Christian and Orthodox countries in the world, um, the means of making modern European weaponry, right? Machine guns, long-range artillery, and began to arm a modern army in Ethiopia, unbeknownst to the Italians, all right? When the Italians eventually tried to invade and press the claims they said they had in, in Ethiopia, they discovered they'd been kind of tricked by Menelik II into thinking the Ethiopians were primitive and lacked modern weapons and organization and ended up being soundly defeated, having their butts kicked right out of Ethiopia by an Ethiopian army that was not just better armed, but better led, right? They successfully outmaneuvered the Italians with better generals. They outgunned them, and they delivered this embarrassing defeat to the Italians at what's known as the Battle of Adwa in 1896, um, which ended the hopes for Italian conquest of Ethiopia for the rest of the century, okay? It wouldn't be until 1936 until World War II that Italy would come back and try again where they would be temporarily successful. The last example I have on here is of Samuri Ture, who was the founder of the Mandinka, sometimes people will call it the Mandingo Empire in Northwest Africa. Um, in building his own African empire, there's kind of an, an irony there as well that this guy was sort of conquering Africans himself as an African. Um, he encountered the French doing the same in West Africa, building their own empire. Which I said is a little bit of I ironic, right? But Touré was able to engage in diplomacy with France's big rival, Britain, who didn't want to go to war with France at the time, but was willing to sell the Mandinka um, large amounts of modern repeating rifles from their ports uh, on the west coast of Africa. And with those weapons and a very well organized army as well, Samore Touré delivered several defeats in direct battle of army versus army to the French, but in the long run, when was unable to sort of resist kind of the might of France's industry, right? Their ability to resupply and and um, refill sort of fresh armies. And although he fights for 16 years with tactics ranging from direct battlefield engagements to guerrilla warfare to scorched earth when they get their most desperate, um, Eventually, he fails, right? Samore Touré was eventually defeated and captured and exiled, where he dies in exile. But it's important to remember that resistance was frequent and common, that nobody sort of accepted this, but that Africans were less well-organized, going through a period of change and flux and instability themselves, and lacked the most advanced kind of modern weapons of the day. That's a picture of Samore Touré. As we get closer here, I mean, photographs become available, right? And we can see some of these figures. Um, Touré was photographed uh, on a couple occasions, but this is one of the most famous of him here. All right, and there are sort of two ways that historians like to talk about the governing of these areas, right? As soon as Europeans, with resistance or not, you know, achieved military success, they quickly assumed the role of governing the areas they'd conquered and created the necessary administrations and infrastructure that they needed to do so efficiently. Um, 
As far as the policies used to actually control the areas, historians will describe these methods as indirect rule and direct rule. We'll try to break these down a little bit here and talk about some of the similarities or differences between them. Indirect rule is said to be favored, kind of the policy favored by the British throughout their colonies, where European elites would be these kind of central administrators, right? The colonial governor and their cabinets, okay? Something at like the president level. If you think of the colony as a country, they would have somebody in charge of that whole territory, a colonial governor, and then a cabinet of administrators, right? The secretary of agriculture, the secretary of the military, a bunch of other Europeans to help them govern the country at the very highest level. But at the, all the local levels, right, from like the province or the state level down to the district level, all those jobs were filled with local elites, local rulers, a lot of times the same people that had been in charge of those areas before the conquest, right? With the same laws that were in place before the conquest. Um, under indirect rule, the British or other Europeans generally tried to interfere less with the traditions and customs of the local people. On a more, you know, pragmatic, realistic way of looking at it is this was also a cheaper way, right? A cheaper way to administer this empire where the British were kind of pushing off the cost of administration onto the people that they'd colonized, right? Taxing them for their own, you know, to govern them, right? I'm going to tax you. I'm going to make you pay me for me to govern you. It's a lot how countries work, I guess. Um Remember, no taxation without representation, right? It might apply in this situation. Um, but that's basically the idea of indirect rule, right? European elites at the very highest levels, but then most of the country governed by local native rulers with, no, with local native laws. Another method um, of indirect rule, you know, looked a lot like that, but would maybe include an alliance with a dominant ethnic group or tribe a tactic known as divide and rule or divide and conquer where Europeans, the British, you know, in this case would ally with maybe the second largest um, ethnic group in a country and pit them against, you know, rival groups in the area and kind of use them to do their dirty work. And after these areas are decolonized, right, and receive their independence, that leads to a lot of like later class and tribal tension between the people that worked closely with the colonial governments and the ethnic groups that allied with them and stuff and the groups that didn't, right? In some case of Rwanda and things like that, people have said this is part of the reason you end up with genocide and, and conflict like that in those countries. And then still another way of thinking of indirect rule is that the European countries themselves were not the ones kind of officially establishing these colonies, but you know, private companies, corporations, business interests from those countries were conquering these areas on their behalf. Think of the East India Company, or we're going to talk about a couple others. I showed you those treaties of the Royal Niger Company, um, uh, diamond companies like De Beers in Africa uh, or in South, South Africa are going to do a lot of this, right? But a corporation kind of conquering these things on behalf of the country that they came from. And at the end of the day, you end up with these territories that are kind of like Chinese tributaries, right? They are, they've been invaded and conquered in a sense, but they're mostly ruling themselves with their local rulers, but they're, some kind of payment is being extracted from them, right? Direct rule, on the other hand, it looked a little similar and a little different, okay? It was... Similar in the sense that at some level, no matter how hard <laughs> Europeans tried, they just did not have a lot of the numbers um, in these colonies that they had in other places. And they could not staff the administration with just only Europeans, right? But the goal in direct rule was to have a lot more European control of the country through administration with a much more centralized government and a lot more Europeans in positions of power. 
Now, these are not the terms I see used in history books, right? But the, a way that I like to think of it um, is like thinking of unitary states and federal states in today's world. Today, you can describe most countries as unitary or federal. The United States is a federal state, right? We have several different layers of government. The federal government, the very top, right? The president, the Supreme Court, our Congress is sort of governing over the whole of the United States, right? But then below the federal level, there is the state level, right? And every state has their own executive, right? A governor and their own legislative. They have their own sort of representative councils and senates. They've got their own court systems. Um, and they make laws at the local level. For example, Nevada has legalized marijuana. That is not legal at the federal level, right? So you have all this independence at the local level level in a federal state. I think that is a lot like kind of indirect rule, right? Ruling over the broad area, but at the local level, there's a lot of independence. A unitary state is like what, for example, France is today. They're a unitary state. If you visited France, there's not one part of the country where one thing is legal and another part of the country where it's illegal. There is one set of laws for France. It is a unitary state. It's one state, right? It's not broken into different districts. They have municipalities and stuff, but you don't, as far as I understand it, find different laws there. It's much more centralized. That's kind of how I think of direct rule, right? One set of laws. Maybe there's Africans helping out, but there's not the kind of local independence you see in the British system, all right? The other part of direct rule um, that the French claimed to be pursuing was a policy of administration, that they were trying to make their colonized people French, right? And eventually French citizens. But this goal came with a lot of requirements that were basically impossible for big chunks of the population to meet. For example, they were expected to speak fluent French, even though the French hadn't established enough schools to really teach it to everybody. They were expected, in order to become a citizen, to have received an award for meritorious service to the French government. Winning an award is hard enough, but even harder if there's not hardly any jobs for you to have to serve the government, right? It's a very small portion of the population that was ever able to achieve this goal of French citizenship. So more an ideology than a real actual goal. But those are the big differences, indirect rule and direct rule. Like I said at the beginning, economically, imperialism can be seen as an economic disaster or an economic improvement for a lot of these countries. I tend to side and my bias is going to come through pretty clear here with the economic disaster uh, argument here. And we'll try to explain that for in a couple ways here. Um, in one sense, uh, native local industries are forced into competition with industrial powers, all right, that the a lot of African countries or in, you know, India, a lot of these places that get colonized were producing goods in local cottage industries by hand with methods that could not compete economically with mass produced goods from Western factories. All right. And when those cheaper foreign goods from Europe were imported into colonies in Africa or India, we will see they put a lot of local producers and artisans out of work. Um, blacksmiths, leather tanners, metal workers all over Africa, for example, disappeared. The flip side of this, we'll, we'll talk about a little bit later um, when we talk about global trade. Um, another issue is that subsistence farmers, right? The farmers that grow food for them and their families to eat, right? Not necessarily to sell to a market. That those subsistence farmers in Africa were growing more cash crops and more crops for export, which meant there was sort of less for subsistence, less for feeding themselves. Well, this actually makes some local farmers very wealthy, right? They start selling a lot more food and cash crops than they had before. Um, but as more and more land was devoted to crops like tea or coffee or palm trees for oil or cotton, less land was used for foodstuffs. And the food that was being grown was also increasingly used for commerce and exported to the mother countries. Um, policies like this would lead to famine whenever hard times like drought or locusts or some economic disruption happened. There was not the necessary food reserves 
to supply these people, right? And if Britain had excess food or France had excess food, they almost never sent it to these places to relieve those famines. Another part of this economic disaster is, is known as statute labor. We've called it core V labor. Strayer in your textbook calls it coerced labor. We can call it slavery is a little bit what it is here. But most colonizers, Britain, France, Germany, whoever it was, extracted some form of forced labor from the colonized. The French, for example, required 10 or 12 days a year from the colonized to work on public or often it was corporate projects, building railroads, normal roads for automobiles, working in mines, working in forests, collecting rubber, whatever it was. This rarely involved any kind of well-paid, kind treatment. And in some cases, it led to workers being worked to death, killed for desertion from these kind of chain gangs they were forced into, being beaten or, like I said, chained together like slaves which in this case they basically were. So even with good treatment, let's say, the work that was being done was work that local farmers weren't doing on their own for farms or businesses, but were instead for the good of some foreign country or company, right? It was wasted time as far as a lot of these people were concerned. The last thing I'd say is resources. I mean, and there's a lot of things we could probably say, but the last thing I would say that leads that where we can describe this as an economic disaster is through the resources that were extracted then and continue to be extracted and sold to foreign countries today. Um, those goods and resources were often being extracted by foreign companies, by local underpaid or forced labor, right? So Africans digging out African resources to be used by European countries um, in European industrial centers and in European factories to produce goods that would be sold back, you know, at a profit to some of these colonies, right? Because they were used as markets as well. So some of those resources like oil or gold or diamonds are also non-renewable -re resources, right? In which case those profits were lost forever, right? You can't get those diamonds or oil or gold back and sell it again for the most part. Now, but you can also kind of make the case that, that there was some economic improvement in the long run here, okay? For example, infrastructure is one argument people often make that, in fact, railroads, ports, roads, those things were really built, right? Public buildings, dams, canals were constructed. The problem was, and the argument I'll make here, is that that infrastructure was mostly built to benefit the colonizers, right? It was very common to see rail lines run from gold mines to coastal ports in many African countries um, and not necessarily connect major population centers to make for a more united country or to even run through, you know, hospitable, hospitable areas where you could, you know, grow communities later, right? But they would take the shortest route from resource area to coast to help export resources, right? So this infrastructure, these roads, hospitals, administrative centers that are being built are mostly to benefit the colonizers and not necessarily to benefit the colonized. Although, you know, those railroads are there once the, these colonies are, are given their independence for the most part. Um, how much it helps them is another discussion. Um, education is another improvement that is in fact received through colonization, right? Schools and churches were built to educate people. But again, on the flip side, I would say it's never very many people. Um, the educations ranged from, you know, the very rudimentary where people were prepared for a little more than kind of just an easier time doing the same work they'd been doing, right? Because they were taught a little English or something like that. Um, but we should say that some of the great African leaders of the 20th century, when these countries received their independence, were educated at similar schools and even went to Europe to attend universities. Um, so in that sense, education did provide those that could get them with better opportunities um, as local administrators or future leaders of their country. Although, again, for the most part, for most people, that education rarely ever translated into political power or voting rights even or citizenship, right, for the vast majority of people. That's not what they ended up getting. Um, and then global trade, right? Um, Africa was increasingly connected to the world's markets, and that's 
arguably a positive thing. The disadvantage was that African resources and profits were under the control of foreign companies again, right? So not all of it was being reinvested in Africa. Those profits were being reinvested in Europe or in colonial militaries or maybe in some other colony that was more profitable than yours, right? Um, in general, in Africa, I think it was an economic disaster that resources were extracted, conflict was started, and more money has maybe been lost for Africans than gained um, during the period of imperialism. Now, in the period after, that's where you can make the case for global trade, right? That African countries are hooked up to this global economy now, even though they're maybe in a dependent relationship there, right? Where they can't demand high prices. There's not a lot of rich African countries, even though they're connected to global trade. So overall, say it doesn't work out for them economically. There's a photograph of one of the um, kind of missionary uh, schools that people attended there. And in, in this case, a kind of church service being held. Um, that's, that's a positive or negative for some of you, right? In, in some case, I mean, there is the missionizing of a particular religion, right? Which can be seen as a good thing or a bad thing. A bad thing in the sense that you're kind of losing local culture to foreign culture. A good thing if you think it's a good thing to spread those religions, right? All right, and then let me close up by giving you some examples of what this conquest on the ground actually looked like, right? Some of these colonies and some of the effects of imperialism in those places, right? Why I and others tend to look at it as a terrible thing for Africa. Um, in the case of South Africa, you can go back to the middle of the 17th century, 1652, when the Dutch settlers known as the Boers in Africa, I think it's just a Dutch word that means farmers, colonized that area. Um, these people speak today a version of Dutch known as Afrikaans, a language that's in a way kind of now native to South Africa, right? But it's derived from Dutch. Um, and right away, uh, these farmers are ruling in a, in a, with a system of white supremacy, right? Africans were seen as inferior. They were used for little more than cheap labor or often outright enslaved. Their lands and cattle were taken by the Boers. They were pushed off areas that they'd lived for generations. And white supremacy was the law of the land, which was not unique to the Dutch, right? In you know, parts of America in the 1600s, North or South America, you can find similar treatment um, between different ethnic groups, right? Particularly white and black in all these areas, right? In the midst of the slave trade. By 1806, Britain annexes, which is a nice way of saying they conquer the Cape Colony of South Africa. Um, if you watch the videos from earlier on African uh, resistance with the Zulu, for example, um, it goes into some detail about those wars, so we won't get into it here, but some um, main issues are, are conflicts over resources and territory between the Dutch and the British. And the British end up eventually conquering um, all this land. Africans were used by the British in their war against the Boers, um, but there was no sort of long-term unity, right? Tribe was played against other tribe by the British and their colonists after this, and African leaders kind of willingly enlisted European settlers in their rivalries with each other as well to gain an advantage, right? Again, if you watch those videos on the Zulu, um, there's not a lot of unity on either side. Um, in this war, though, this is, you know, part of what um, Bismarck was hoping to avoid when he calls the... Berlin Conference, right? European country fighting European country. And the end result of this is 75,000 colonists dead, right? 22,000 British soldiers, um, six or 7,000 Boer soldiers, but then something like, you know, 28,000 Boer civilians um, that died in concentration camps, essentially, all right? Um, these are the areas in South Africa that end up being colonized by uh, the Dutch initially and then the British, right? And the lands that the Dutch get pushed onto 
all of the land that you see on here that's yellow or orange eventually comes under British control. Photographs we have of some of the Boer settlers in this case, right? Guys that uh, are out there on an African field holding their weapons during the war. And then these are images from some of the first concentration camps um, used in war. In this case, concentration camps in South Africa, where Boer civilians were rounded up and put into these camps where disease was common, starvation was common. And this is where the majority of those close to 30,000 civilians die. One of the long run negatives of colonization in South Africa is the policy of apartheid, which again is not unique or unknown, you know, and, and there was other places ruling like that in the world, the United States in particular, but apartheid literally means apartness, right? And uh, involved Africans in South Africa being removed from white society, right? Well, this is actually a picture of the American South, all right? But when we're talking about an apartheid state, that's what we're talking about, right? In a, a legally segregated country with different roles for white and different roles for black people. This is from South Africa, right? Danger, natives, Indians, and coloreds. If you enter these premises at night, you will be listed as missing. In this case, they mean Indians like Indians from India, who were also a minority population in South Africa. A white beach, right? There would be signs for a, you know, black only part of the beach. Um, the What you see on this map, if you look around these areas of kind of color that you see in the beige there, the pinks and orange and greens. Those are areas known uh, as homelands, or they were called Bantu stands, like saying Afghanistan or something like that, Bantu stands. Um, this was where close to 90% of the black and mixed ethnic population of South Africa, um, where they were attempted to be placed, all right, where so that most of the land could be in the hand of the about 15% white population. Um, these policies exist legally in Africa or South Africa up until 1994, all right? Um, so a while after we end segregation in the United States. But these are images from modern day South Africa. And you can see that even though the legal framework of apartheid has ended, um, segregation still exists, right? The neighborhood on the right is a black African neighborhood. The neighborhood on the left is a white Af uh, South African neighborhood, right? And you can see a giant disparity in the amenities and construction and infrastructure that these people have with people you know, in the black neighborhoods living in kind of shanty town, cramped in boxes with no yards or space, and these people in the white neighborhoods living in suburbs that look very, very much like places where you or I live right now. One of the major architects of imperialism in South Africa is this guy here, Cecil Rhodes. If you've ever heard of uh, somebody being a Rhodes scholar, um, that's from this guy's fund, okay? He becomes fabulously rich through his colonizing imperialist efforts in Africa. Um, Cecil Rhodes was a British statesman, but also a businessman, right? He created the De Beers Company. If you ever heard of the De Beers Diamond Company, it's still around and important in the diamond world to mine diamonds in South Africa. Um, his company, the British South Africa Company, another one of his companies, establishes the colony called Rhodesia, actually named after him, right? A colonial country established by this guy, what is today modern Zimbabwe and Zambia, was once the colony of Rhodesia. Rhodes used his wealth to build railroads and telegraph lines, and again, like I said, to personally help establish some of these colonies. I like to include him in here as a great example of the union between kind of corporate and state interest that was driving a lot of this conquest and, and you know, military adventuring throughout Africa. 
Also, I've included one of the really famous primary sources, a speech that he gives. I encourage you to look at it because there's some creepy lines in here that I think are excellent. I'll kind of just skip right to the end here where you can get into a look into this guy's mindset, but also some kind of real creepy talk, some conspiracy, you know, theory sounding talk here. So if you look at the last two paragraphs, um, and it'll make more sense if you read the, whole, the rest of it here, but um, it says, in the present day, I became, I become a member of the Masonic order, like the Masons, right? The Freemasons. I see the wealth and power they possess, the influence they hold. And I think over their ceremonies, and I wonder, that a large body of men can devote themselves to what at times appear the most ridiculous and absurd rites, without an object and without an end. The idea gleaming and dancing before one's eyes, like a will-o'-the-wisp, at last frames itself into a plan. Why should we not form a secret society with but one object? The furtherance of the British Empire, and the bringing of the whole uncivilized world under British rule for the recovery of the United States, for the making the Anglo-Saxon race but one empire, what a dream. But yet it is probable. It is possible. Um, this is actually kind of an edited version of the speech, but he's saying, you know, we should make a secret society to control the world. Um, I love it. Uh, worth reading and looking over. And if you can find the longer version of his speech, it gets even a little creepier than that. The last example I'll give um, is one of the most infamous examples of European colonialism, the Belgian Congo, right? This big chunk of Central Africa colonized by the tiny country of Belgium. Um, the Central African region of the Congo, right? The Congo rainforest is one of the largest rainforests in the world and contains many valuable resources. Um, the estimated value of the whole area is, you know, in the trillions and trillions of dollars, if you could extract all that wealth. Um, the first of those resources to really be pursued by the Belgians in that area was, you know, well, I guess was slaves initially, but was ivory, okay, which you can see people holding here. As you can find, look for Congolese ivory or ivory in the Congo, and you will see mountains of this stuff piled up, lots of pictures like this with lots of people holding giant elephant tusks. Um, but ivory was great because it could be used for all kinds of products, right? From toys, you know, chess pieces to teeth and things like that. Um, rubber uh, came along later uh, during the Industrial Revolution as one of the primary commodities people were interested in. As it turns out, a lot of different plants, oftentimes people will talk about rubber trees, but a lot of different plants contain materials a lot like latex, right, that you can extract to make rubber. In the Congo, it was the Landolfia vines. You see these guys trying to extract the, the rubber sap from. Um, and at this time, uh, rubber was popular for bicycle and automobile tires that were becoming more and more common, conveyor belts and the tools of industry. Um, in order to harvest this stuff, Africans would be rounded up, um, chained together to get their work done, and forced out as laborers, right? Like we talked about in previous slides. Um, this looks a lot like slavery. In fact, I mean, a lot of the people um, that saw these groups walking around, you know, were firmly convinced that slavery had returned to the area. And you could definitely argue that it it had, right? Europeans didn't like to use those terms, but well, these guys are chained by their neck to each other and they're going to be forced into the forest to collect rubber. Um, one of the things that makes the situation of the Congo even more interesting is that it was sort of personally under the control of one individual, all right? The colony founded by Belgium, known as the Congo Free State, was under the personal command of King Leopold, the ruler of Belgium, um, or, you know, sort of the king of Belgium, not necessarily the ruler. They had a separate sort of republic, a kind of constitutional monarchy. Um, under Leopold's, Leopold's rule, Belgium used terror, right, actual sort of terrorism and force to extract resources from Africans in the Congo, rubber and other minerals. Um, towns and villages basically would be invaded 
by Leopold's 20,000-man personal army, the Force Publique. Um, the men would be separated from the women and sent into the forest to extract a certain quota of rubber, while the women were held hostage by his soldiers. When workers would fail to meet those quotas, they would be shot. Um, excuse me, they would be shot or sometimes mutilated. These are pictures of uh, missionaries, I believe, for the most part, posing with African children and men and women that have been mutilated for either failing to meet the quota um, or sometimes people that were killed. Um, the Belgian soldiers were expected to take some kind of trophy, a right hand or their head, to prove that the bullets hadn't been wasted. Um, but there's a lot of these pictures of people mutilated and mangled for not harvesting enough rubber. Um, if you remember reading about Columbus and the Native Americans, we talked about a similar tactic that was used there, right? That Native Americans were given copper medallions to wear around their neck when they had collected the proper amount of gold from the surrounding area and if they were found without that medallion they too were mutilated and attacked right so that this is not something unheard of it was just maybe getting a little out of date by the time that it happened either way the international community finds out about this about these atrocities and they are atrocious all right um the estimation of deaths in the you know 15 20 years that leopold is in charge of the belgian congo is somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 million that's about half of what congo's 20 million population was estimated to be back then right 50 percent of the population killed through terror and brutality is worse than a holocaust right i mean that's 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 alarming or at least the Jewish part of the Holocaust. Um, international attention, like I said, fell on the Belgians for these atrocities they were committing in the Congo, and Leopold was asked to relinquish control of the colony to the Belgian government, which he did after he made them pay him for it. Um, he ended up becoming a billionaire off of the wealth he extracted from the Congo Free State and off of its sale to the Belgian government. Um, he sort of retires super rich and, you know, is certainly not punished or anything for his actions in the Congo. But that concludes the lecture I have for you on Africa, okay? That ended up being a little long. I've got a lot of extra information I included in this one that I won't need to include when we talk about India or China. So those ones should be a little bit shorter, all right? But I encourage you to take a minute to go back through, watch some of these videos. Um, the one on this slide actually has a kind of reenactment of somebody's hand getting cut it off, cut off you know it's horror movie stuff it's fake of course but and it's from a pbs documentary but be warned you know there is kind of a gruesome scene in there of of people getting their hands cut off um but i hope that helped you and improved your understanding on the topic i'll be posting other videos this week so keep checking back and as we finish up we will begin our review